Hello everybody. Colum Killa and Adovnan were two of the most important people in these islands in the 6th and 7th centuries. Adovnan might be better know, uh, known now uh, in Irish as Alnon or in English as Unan. There's pre-recorded lectures going out on the 24th of September. So yesterday, 23rd of September, was the feast day of Adovnan, the anniversary of his death in the year 704. Before I continue talking about these two, two men, I must start off by thanking Paula Freeland, Derry City and Strabane District Council for the invitation to take part in this very interesting and prestigious series of lectures focusing on the many issues of language as they affect life, culture and indeed politics, particularly here in the northwest of Ireland. Although I was brought up largely in English-speaking Dublin, I now live in the largely Irish-speaking Gaeltacht area of Dunluithia in West Donegal. So many issues of language arise for me personally in my ordinary daily life. Languages are one of the greatest achievements of human evolution, but clearly they can also be tricky, not to mention being complicated and controversial. I'm conscious that this online lecture was originally to have been given in, uh, in reality in the Tower Museum in Derry, uh, just inside the 17th century walls of London Derry, and that issues of names as just one aspect of language, require careful consideration and analysis in our context. For instance, many people think that there are only two versions of the name of this city, but in 1995 I was asked to survey the various forms of its names, and I came up with actually over 50 different variations, that is various spellings and different combination of words in the relevant uh, three languages, uh, English, Irish and Latin. The Maiden City, of course, is not the only entity in the world with a, a name problem. My own surname is case in point. My family name is a five-letter word, L-A-C-E-Y. But as it happened when my father was registering my birth, somehow or other the letter E got left out. That missing E has haunted me all my life, and I've had to take various practical measures to deal with it down the years. Since 9-11, for instance, with the greater concentration in global security matters, one of the most important things for me is that when I'm booking an airline ticket, I have to remember that my surname is officially a four-letter word. Uh, if I present myself at an airport check-in with a, a ticket that says Lacey with an E and a passport that says Lacey without the E, I'm unlucky to be allowed to, be, to get on the plane, uh, without a lot of fuss anyway, and usually have to pay a bit more money to change the ticket. To add to that confusion, when as a six-year-old at primary school, I was given the first, for the first time an Irish language version of my surname, the teacher chose the form De Lace, a Gaelicised form of the Anglo-Norman name De Lacey. But as an adult, I learned that because my Lacey surname comes from a particular area in the province of Leinster, it wasn't an Anglo-Norman name at all, but actually an Anglicised form of a Gaelic name Elahasi. Now, I'm reminded of all these name matters when I come to deal with the two men, Colm Kill and Adivanon, who are the main subjects of my talk today. There are various issues for both of them associated with their names. For instance, many of us know Colm Killa by that Gaelic form of his name, but some people only know him as Columba, which of course is the form of his name in Latin, or by the anglicised versions of it, such as, uh, as is used, for instance, in St. Columb's Cathedral, or St. Columns College. I will deal more with those name matters lately. However, Colum Killen Adivnon spent much of their lives on the Hebridean island of Iona off the west coast of Scotland. But Iona was not the name of that island when the monks went there for the first time, and it really shouldn't be the, its name now, uh, now either. Iona is in fact a spelling mistake, a medieval spelling mistake. As far as we know, the island was referred to in the 6th century by the simple name E, that's just the letter I with a, an accent on it. A Gaelic word that meant tree, or possibly uh, more particularly yew tree. Well, when the monks began to write about the island in Latin, they had to give it what we'd call an adjectival form of its name, something more like tree island, or even tree e island. Um, so in Latin, that was insula, iova, 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 
But at some stage, some poor anonymous medieval monk misread and miscopied the V of Iova as an N, and hence the an erroneous name Iona was born. It has remained Iona ever since, despite being evidently wrong. One of the reasons why the name I I Iona might have stuck, however, is because of its similarity with the biblical name Jonah. That is, as we would pronounce it anyway, Jonah. But originally the J of Jonah would have been pronounced softly, and, the name would, and that name would have sounded much, much more like something like Iona or even Iona. In the preface of the life he wrote in Latin about Columba or Columcilla, Adavnon tells us that the Hebrew form of the name Columba, which of course in English means dove, that the Hebrew form of Columba is Jonah. For good measure, he also tells us that the Greek form of, his, of Columba's name is Peristera. Thus, in the three sacred languages of the time, Latin, Greek and Hebrew, each of them known at least to some extent by Adavnon, Columba, Jonah or Jonah and Peristera all meant the same thing which was the same name of the saint who had founded the monastery of Iona. Now, perhaps the use of Latin and Greek by Adavnon is less surprising to us now than his use of, um, the, of, of Greek. But to what extent there was a knowledge of classical Greek uh, in early medieval Ireland is frequently debated by academics. But a few examples from close to home might be instructive. The oldest, the oldest surviving um, copy of Adavnon's Vita Columba or Life of Columba. Uh, it dates to about 700 and this is a, a facsimile of the manuscript but written on the very last page is the Our Father in Greek. Um, now we don't know when or where that uh, Our Father was added because it's as it were it's on a blank page so it could have been added more or less at any time. But what we have there is a manuscript made in Scotland, in, made in Iona, made in Scotland, by an Irish monk taken to Germany before it was transferred to Switzerland with its Greek edition of the Our Father. You could almost imagine an 8th or 9th century uh, version of Ryanair being involved in the whole business. Incidentally, the next three oldest manuscripts of the same text of, of Adavnon's Vita Columbae are in the British Library in London now, but they derive from Durham Cathedral, where there was a devotion to St. Columba all through the Middle Ages. Durham Cathedral is the direct institutional descendant of the monastery on Lindisfarne Island off the Northumberland coast, just north of Newcastle upon Tyne. Which had, and the monastery there had been founded by Irish monks from Iona about the year 635. Now Durham Cathedral preserved several relics and manuscripts associated with St Columba right through the Middle Ages. For instance, the only text we have, the only text in existence naming the immediate members of Columkill's family, excuse me, and the names of the monks who went with them originally to Iona, the only copy of that was preserved in Durham. Without that Durham manuscript, we just wouldn't know these things. To return to the issue of Greek, not far from Derry is the ancient ecclesiastical site at Fawn in the Michon, where there's a beautiful uh, slab, um, you might be able to see that, cross slab, which was almost certainly carved by a Pictish stonemason, or certainly by a, a local um, a mason, maybe from in Michon, but to a Pictish design. The slab has a quotation in Greek written all along its northern edge and the quotation is, is a prayer or strictly referred to as a doxology and it says glory and honour to the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit written in Greek. That particular formula, formulation of the prayer was adopted by the Council of Toledo in Spain in the year 633. Uh, the inscription, that Greek inscription at Fawn, appears to be the oldest such use of Greek anywhere in Western Europe. Now, the date of the slab is not agreed. It is sometimes suggested that it was, it was made during Adavnon's lifetime, but it is more probable that it was carved within a few decades after his death in the early 8th century. But again, looking at that Fawn slab in an international context, we have a Spanish prayer in the Greek language, carved in an Irish monastery 
by probably a Pictish craftsman. Reiner seems to be involved in that as well. You could read this section about Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, where Abbot Noan talks about the names of Columba in those three languages. You could could take it as a kind of showing off, a philological or linguistic showing off. But maybe Adam Rohn was just making some very interesting linguistic points. It is extremely obvious when we look at all the things that Adam Rohn wrote, among them the oldest surviving um, guidebook to the Holy Land in Western Europe. This is the this is the Locus Sanctus written by Adam Rohn. It's the oldest surviving guidebook to the Holy Land, dating to about 690 or thereabouts. Um, and he also wrote, by the way, this text, um, which is the oldest surviving text from anywhere in Western Europe of a law for the protection of non-combatants in time of war. In other words, the precursor of the Geneva Convention. Now, I say, um, uh, Adonon wrote these things, and it's clear that he was fascinated by different languages. Um, and indeed language as a phenomenon of hu human nature. And in a way that is, I think, very recognisably Irish, he loved playing with words and with the various languages at his disposal. I'll come back to that matter later. But clearly language, languages other than his own were no barrier to Adhanam. Instead, he saw them as an opportunity for seeing the great variety of, his, as he would have thought, thought of it, God's creation. Uh, and indeed as an opportunity for playful, intellectual playing with words. Both Columba and Adathnaut came from what is now County Donegal, which, which of course means the fort of the foreigners, although that name did not exist in the time of either of those two men. Almost certainly it is originated in the 9th century with the Vikings, just as the Hebrides, where Iona is situated, Became, became known in, in Irish and Scottish Gaelic as Mahinchagal, the islands of the foreigners. Um, and that's also probably because of the Vikings. There are, of course, many other Viking influences on our languages. For instance, most of the words in Irish connect with money, commerce and marketing derived from the Viking language, uh, uh, Old Norse, because the, the, the medieval Irish didn't use money. Now, Columba lived during the last three quarters of the 6th century, from about 520 to 593, while Adavnon lived in the last three quarters of the 7th century, from about 624 to 704. Both men were distantly related to each other, and Adavnon was the ninth abbot of Iona that, of course, had been founded by Columba. There weren't any birth certificates around in the 6th century, but by tradition, Columba was born on the 7th of December. While there's some confusion in the sources, recent research seems to confirm that he was born in the year 520. Thus, in a few months' time, on the 7th of December this year, we will, we will be marking the 1,500th anniversary of his birth. By the way, the 7th of December has another major significance in the history, in the history of the city. It was the actual date of the shutting of the gates leading to the Siege of Derry. Because changes to the calendar in the 18th century, that event is now commemorated 11 days later on the 18th of December. But the true date, the correct date, is actually the 7th of December, the same day as Columbus' birthday. So maybe there could be some sort of joint commemoration this year. Columba, of course, is treated in both Derry and London Derry as the founder of the monastery that gave rise to the later city. As far back as about 1983, however, I had concluded from research I was doing that there was no historical truth to that claim at all, that it was a legend. The contemporary sources actually say that Derry was founded by somebody else, a man called Fierre Mac Kiran. Um, when my heresy about this became more widely known, the late Paddy Bogside Doherty quipped in relation to Colum Killer that it wouldn't be the only instance in the history of the city when someone got the credit for a job they didn't do. Just as, for example, most of our knowledge about the Greek philosopher Socrates really comes to the writings of his follower Plato, most of what we know about Colum Killer comes in the writings of Adavnon. Perhaps, perhaps ironically, 
much if not most of what we know about Adenon as a person comes from the writings of a great, the great Anglo-Saxon saint and writer, the Venerable Bede. Bede tells us a lot about Adenon in his book Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorum, the, ecclesi- the Ecclesiastical History of the English People. For the most part, um, Bede is very uh, complimentary about, about Adenon, not completely, but most, most part. Although written in Latin, Bede's text is one of the founding documents of English literature. Ironically, it is a novel, I have to say, and most of it very positive, about Ireland and the Irish. Adavnon's great text about Columcilla, the Vita Columbae, was also written in Latin, but his maternal tone and that of Columcilla would have been Old Irish or Gaelic. However, multilingualism was very much part of their world, and sometimes it was seen as a, it was a source of great cultural playfulness. Both men li- lived their lives not only in Ireland, but also in Northern Britain, where they encountered and used in varying degrees the several uh, languages in use across the different polities uh, there in the north of Britain at the time. Those languages would have consisted of Gaelic and Latin, of course, but also Pictish in northeastern Scotland and a separate language in the Cumbrian Strathclyde region. Both Pictish and that Strathclyde Cumbrian language were what we call now P-Celtic, um, and indeed the latter of them was an, answer, an ancestor of the language we now call Welsh. Both Columba and certainly Adamnon encountered also a very early form of Anglo-Saxon, or Old English, which was then only a relatively recent incomer to what we now call England. One of Adamnon's pupils, for instance, um, a man called Aldfred, went on to become a famous king of Northumbria and was known in both Britain and Ireland as, with the Latin phrase, sapiens, that is, he was a very wise man. Now, Alfred's father, who was also a famous Anglo-Saxon king, Oswu, uh, but the genea- that, that was Alfred's father, Oswu, but the genealogies say that his mother, Alfred's mother, came from Inishon, where Alfred certainly spent some of his, his, younger, uh, his young life. We know, for instance, that Alfred was fluent in English, Latin and Irish. Indeed, a number of texts in Irish are claimed to have been written by him. And as improbable as it seems, this famous English king was said to have written a number of things in the Irish language, including an important wisdom or philosophical text. Alfred certainly came from a supremely intellectual heritage on his Irish mother's side. One of his older maternal cousins, and possibly his teacher when he was a young lad, was a a man called Conthelod Magallilu, who was also described as a sapiens, or wise man, and also came from Inishon. And he was a leading exponent of both native Irish and Christian canon law. Conthelod, in fact, is remembered in the history of Irish culture and literature as the person who brought together in one school the study of Fainicus, that is, native Irish law, Filioch, that is, Irish language, poetry, and historical law, and Legend, that is, Latin ecclesiastical learning and canon law, which was, of course, introduced by the Christian Church. So King Alfred of Northumbria's uh, maternal grandfather from Inishon was an important um, uh, 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 was an important local king called Colomon Reved. Now the second name of his, uh, the second part of his name, Reved, means counter, as in the children's rhyme that the king was in his counting house counting all his money, etc. And Reved, in fact, is an ancestor of the modern word in Irish for a computer. So King Alfred of Northumbria, great Anglo-Saxon king, had been educated in Ireland, learned Irish, wrote in Irish, um, and was connected to several leading members of the Inishon community, including the great intellectual Count Faelid. As well as the Anglo-Saxon king, Alfred, Adonun was also friends with a number of Pictish kings, including Brita son of Billa and Brita son of Derylae. Um, and Brita son of Derylae was actually a supporter uh, of Adonun's law for the protection of non-combatants. 
Now that law, uh, I showed you earlier, was written in Old Irish. So at very minimum, it had to be translated into Pictish, whether in written or oral form, so that King Breda could know what was in it and, and so support it. Columba too engaged on a personal basis with various members of the Pictish um, aristocracy and various cultural leaders, Pictish cultural leaders, including their king, Bride, son of Melacon. Now, Columba does not seem to have known the Pictish language to any extent, as Adavnon describes him preaching to the king, King Breda, through an, an interpreter. Um, according to some uh, to, according to Adavnon, after some initial hostility, Breda became very friendly with Columba and afterwards treated him with great, uh, great respect. Another Scottish king, and I have to say I use the word Scottish, Scotland and Scot Scottish um, in a kind of advised context, but at any rate, another Scottish king whom uh, Adavnon describes as a friend of Columba was Riddirk ab Tudwa, the king of the Britons of Strathclyde. Now we don't know what language they communicated, but the language of those people was, as, as I said earlier, a form of Pea Celtic and related in some way to what we now know as modern Welsh. Columkill and Adavnon lived in a world of several languages and multilingualism. Both of them were Irish, as were all the original monks who accompanied Columba to, Adav uh, to Iona. But Adavnon tells us that in a very short time, the makeup of that monastery uh, became much more diverse. And Adavnon, in fact, he, and he writes about, and he talks about monks from British Celtic, Celtic backgrounds, from Pictish backgrounds, from Anglo-Saxon backgrounds, all joining the Irish monks um, on Iona. And that sort of mix continued right through the later history of the monastery, until ultimately they were joined by people from a Scandinavian or um, uh, Viking background. Indeed, several of the monasteries dedicated to St. Colin Kiel around Dublin and the hinterland of Dublin were not founded by either Irish or Scottish monks, but by the recently Christianised uh, Norse kings of Dublin, uh, some of whom were actually kings of both Dublin and York, the city of York in England at the same time. Now, although monasteries by their nature would have been quiet places, monks were restricted from speaking, uh, when the monks did talk, there must have been an element of the Tower of Babel about these Columban monasteries with all the different languages uh, that the, the monks had. Um, although it is, seem, does seem possible that they actually communicated with each other uh, through the lingua franca of um, Latin. To return to the issue of names, the names of both Columkilla and Adafnon raise interesting issues of language. Many people will know the legendary story about how Column Killer was first known as a child by the name Criffin. Criffin is, is an Irish word that can mean fox, the animal fox, or by extension something like sly or wily, that kind of a idea. In the legend, angels come down from heaven and, and tell everyone that that name is not appropriate for a would-be saint, does it? So it has to be changed to Column Killer or dove of the church. However, it is very unlikely that Columba or Columkill was ever actually called Columkilla in his own lifetime. That name and the story that goes with it is part of a hagiographical development of his cult as a saint, which evolved after his death. As we saw in, in Latin, he was, he was known as Columba, a Christian name that literally means dove and which was borrowed into Irish as column, column with a final B, as in St. Columns College, St. Columns Cathedral. Uh, and it was normal for monks to adapt, uh, sorry, to adopt a new Christian name when they entered the, a monastery. Um, and it's, it's, it seems quite possible that, that Columba only became Columba, as it were, when he um, entered a, a monastery as a young man. And the same would seem to be true although we can't be sure for Adavnon. Uh, that is that Adavnon was only a name given to him as a monastic name when he was an adult, when he was an adult rather. However, the name Adavnon seems to uh, derive from an, a, a word in Old Irish, 
which means something like fear or awe or even terror. But it was sometimes understood as an Irish form of the biblical name Adam, Adam and Eve. Like the question about my own surname, however, there's a great controversy um, about how you spell Adam Nunn's name. And that controversy lasted over a thousand years. Um, whether there's a, a, a middle O, Adam Nunn, or Adam Nunn. Um, and as patron saint of both the Catholic and the Church of Ireland Diocese of Rafo, here in Donegal where I am, he is usually known as Elnon with a middle A. That's a, a modern pronunciation of Adonon with a, an A. But anyway, academics uh, insist on using the older form of the no. Um, although he did not himself provide us with an, Irish, uh, an original Irish version of his name, four times in the Vita Columbae he Latinized his, his own name in the phrase Mihi Adamnano, to me Adamnon. He clearly spelt it with an O. The name Adavnon is made up of three elements. The first is what we call an emphatic, the ad, ad, and it just means, you know, there with a capital T-H. Um, the second word, uh, root is um, and that's a word meaning fear or awe or terror or something like that. And then the final uh, um, is what we call a hypocoristic or endearing term in Irish. It's very similar to the way people use the word we in, in, in Scotland and Ulster English. But of course, we, the English word we is derived ultimately from a Gaelic word, biog or vig, meaning small and little. Anyway, in that sense, the full name Adavnon would have meant something originally like man of great dread or man of great fear or something like that. And it, it is, it probably means referencing fear of God in that sense, rather than fear of monsters or whatever. Anyway, the Scottish Celtic uh, scholar Gilbert Marcus drew attention to the use of the same word, or at least a cognate word, in the Annals of Ulster. And this is it, this is, might be to topical for us now, given that, that we're in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, because the reference is for the year 826, and uh, what it says is, uh, in Irish, it says, Adavna mor for Aaron Nilla idon rabo plag. Great terror or great fear in all Ireland. That is from the plague, a warning of the plague. Now, spelt with both a middle O or a middle A, Adavnon is a comparatively rare name. But at least we know the names of at least three other Adamnons, or, Ad, or, or, or whether it's an O or an A. Uh, in the year 730, for instance, a bishop of a place called Rachnogre Ainig, in East Donegal, near Lifford, um, died, Adamnon, who died in that year, 730. Another in um, man is that the Venerable Bede, I mentioned the Anglo Saxon saint and scholar, the Venerable Bede, tells us about an Irish ascetic monk in um, lived in Coldingham in England, now in Berwickshire, on the borders with Scotland and, and northeastern England. Um, and he lived in the 680s, about the same time as Adavnon of Ziona. And then we know of another Adavnon of about the same date from County Mayo. So it was a rare name, but it wasn't unique to the man, uh, the abbot of Iona. In discussing this matter about the spelling and the meaning of Adavnon, however, Gilbert Marcus, the Scottish historian I mentioned a moment ago, has, he's written a fascinating article about all this, and he distinguishes the subtlety between the etymology or the roots of a name and the evolving meaning of the name. So, to, you know, a name can have two things. There's the roots, where what it comes from originally, but then it's given extra meaning as the time goes by. And he accepts that the name Adavnon comes from the Irish root word for fear, but he argues that it also came to be understood as meaning little Adam. And he equates it with a very r rare word in, in Latin, homunculus, homunculus meaning little man, or even, in, as, as we said earlier, wee man. Lots of wee men, and uh, I've been introduced to them in Derry, but they, you could address them in Latin as homunculus. The word homunculus appears to be, have been a favourite of Adavnon's. And Mar 
excuse me, Marcus points out that of only 12 known occurrences of the world, of the word, in the whole of European literature between the years 501 and 737. That's, there's only 12 known references to that word in all the surviving literature from Europe from in those uh, uh, couple of hundred years, that eight of them, eight of the 12, come from works written by Adamnon. So it's very clear that Adamnon thought of homunculus as a kind of a, a pun on his own name. Um, now, apart from um, the three main works that we know were definitely written by Adamnon, that is his great life of Columba, the Vita Columbae, his book about the Holy Land I mentioned earlier, and his law for the protection of non-combatants in time of, of war. Uh, various other pieces are attributed to him, so some of which could have been written by other people, but they're attributed to Adamnon. And one such piece is a poem in Latin, uh, Agitor Laborantium, Helper of Workers is the meaning. And it used to be thought that this poem was lost, but in the 1980s it was identified in a, an 11th century Anglo-Saxon manuscript from Winchester Cathedral. And all these cathedrals in England saving as or preserving the manuscripts relating to both Column Kill and Adhavnum. Anyway, the poem is, is kind of a litany, like a litany. And um, uh, uh, modern, more recent research has now attributed it to uh, Adhavnum. And the poem has 25 lines, all ending in the syllable um, very Latin. It is what we call abegadarian in form, that is, each subsequent line of the poem begins with whatever is the next letter of the alphabet. Um, now, uh, uh, whoever, whoever the author of this poem was, he describes himself in the poem as a homunculus. Remember that word from a few moments ago. And he describes himself as a homunculus, a little man trembling and most wretched, rowing through the infinite storm of his age. Now, I'm not going to read you the whole poem, but I just want to give you a flavour of it. Agitor laborantium bonorum rectum omnium, custos ad pronaculum, devens orsque credentium, exultator humilium fractor superpientium. And it goes on, each, as I say, each line of the poem. Uh, beginning with the next letter. I don't know if this will reproduce, but that's the, the poem. <laughs> now, uh, Gilbert Marcus argue uh, that in using the word homunculus in the poem, its author had an effect, if you like, identified himself as that of none. And by using that word, he had in effect secretly signed the poem so that his name is, is, um, is enshrined in the poem. Now, everything that we can definitely confirm as having been written by this man, Adafnon, is in Latin. But some pieces in Irish are also attributed to him, but his, his authorship of those is not so definite at all. But at the very beginning of his book about Columba, he makes a very odd remark about the Irish language. Um, in the opening paragraph, and, and he's writing in Latin, of course, but in the very first paragraph of the book, he literally apologises for what will be, as he says, his necessary use of Irish language words and names in the text that follows. And he says, these are the words he actually used. There are words here in the poor Irish language, strange names of men and people and places, names which I think are crude in comparison with the different tones of foreign races. And uh, you might be interested that he, the, the, the name he gives to the Irish language, the word he uses for the Irish language is Scottish, which I suppose would be translated now more like Scottishness or something. But of course, Scotland is a name originally meaning Ireland gets transferred to Scotland. So the Scottish language of the 7th century is actually the Irish language. Anyway, as several commentators have noticed, this very what appears to be the very poor opinion of Irish, uh, of the Irish language, was in direct conflict with Adavnon's actual use of the language. Uh, where in the words of another scholar, the, a Frenchman called Jean-Michel Picard, Jean-Michel Picard says that when you read Adavnon's text, he appears to be very proud of his native language, although he, he kind of apologises in the opening. Um, anyway, I believe this kind of odd phrase by Adavnon 
can be understood in two quite different and maybe even contradictory senses. It can be understood at face value, but more than likely sardonically addressed uh, to any reader not lucky enough to know the Irish language. And B, as a, as a separate um, explanation, I think it's a kind of tongue-in-cheek joke for his Irish readers. We know that one of the, uh, the audiences Adamon's book was written for was the Anglo-Saxon clergy of Northumbria, who'd sort of, if you like, um, re rejected aspects of the Irish church um, about 50 years before uh, Adamon was writing, all to do with the con calculation of the date of Easter, but I won't go into that today. Um, anyway, it, so Adamon is addressing these English clerics and he kind of apologises for using Irish, but it's clear that he's not apologising at all. He's delighted to be using them. And the phrase has what I would see as a pure distilled Irish contradictory wit about it. The Irish have always known their place, most especially when addressing the English. And of course, English, the English language was itself only in its infancy, in, in, in terms of writing at any rate, at that point. I think Adovnon was actually rubbing it into the English that they were only beginning to write in their language, whereas in Ireland we had a, a history of writing in the Irish language. At any rate, it becomes absolutely apparent when proceeding to read the Vita Columbae that the very opposite, the real truth, Adovnon is not apologising at all. He actually exults in using the Irish language, although he's writing in Latin. He drags in or puts in the Irish language as often as he possibly can. Of course, that is his own mother tongue. In a few instances, he Latinized Irish words, uh, including his own name, while respecting the appropriate grammar of both the Latin and Irish languages. And indeed, um, I can't show you, unfortunately, but in this book is the oldest surviving version of the name, the oldest surviving written version, of the name of Derry. And uh, he gives it in both forms. He gives it, first of all, in Irish itself as Darachalge. And then he Latinizes that as Roberatum Calgaki, Roberatum uh, deriving from oak trees and um, Roberatum Calgaki being a, a, the, simply the Latin version of the name Darachalge. So he, he uses both forms. Now, he clearly could have done that sort of thing, Latinized names, much more often if he really wanted to. If he, if he wanted to get rid of what he called the strange names of men and people and places. Um, but, but he didn't. So, in a way that is very recognisable, I think, and very recognisably Irish, I think Adovnon loved playing with unusual words and all the variety of languages relevant to his theme. So in that one book, uh, uh, the Vita Columbi, he uses four different languages, Latin, Irish, Greek and Hebrew. So as I said before, both Columba and Adovnon lived in a world of many languages and indeed of multilingualism, where people had several languages. Whatever problems this cr created for them, they evidently found practical ways to overcome all the language difficulties that, that existed for them in addressing and doing business with the, the people from the different ethnic and language groups that populated the areas of Ireland and Northern Britain where they lived and worked. Far from being phased by the multiplicity of languages they had to deal with, this clearly didn't bother them at all. In Adelon's case in particular, as we don't really have the evidence for Columba, um, and as a highly intelligent, cultivated and humane individual, Adelon found great delight and intellectual sustenance in what I might call the garden of all the language flowers that he lived among. The attitude to different languages expressed by these two individuals in the 6th and 7th century is surely a timely lesson to us now in the 21st. Thank you.